I'll be talking about the gap between those guiding programs from a system level and those implementing programs on the ground and how this gap may be bridged from an Ontario um, perspective. So um, an overview here of the rest of the presentation, I'll just um, bring your attention to the four themes under the results um, piece there, and that's going to be guiding the bulk of this presentation. Okay, so this is just a bit of context for those outside Ontario. So Ontario health teams were introduced back in 2019 by the Ministry of Health, and these are organizations and providers working across sectors to provide coordinated care in a clinically and, and fiscally accountable way for a defined geographical population. And the goal is for every Ontarian to eventually belong to one. And currently, I believe there are 58 OHTs. So um, we at HSPN have really been evaluating the progress of this initiative in various forms. And this slide simply provides an overview of a developmental evaluation we recently conducted with OHTs. Um, the first column you see here lists um, areas that were being prioritized by these teams and progress in these areas were then associated with what you see in the second column. So things like trust, shared values, um, you know, making time for sense making, um, alignment across sectors, distributed leadership, communication, and so on. So OHT development was certainly frustrated by the absence of the things listed in the second column here, but one of the things that kept coming up was the impact that the system and policy context had on um, team development. And that's what you see in the third column. So participants talked about how progress was frustrated by changing accountability and reporting structures, conflicting information, a death of long-term direction, pre-existing system constraints, and this impacted things like data sharing and long-term funding. And um, there sometimes seem to be misalignment as well between OHT and provincial priorities. So given the prominence of this theme, we thought it worthwhile to explore it further. So um, um, th that's essentially what we ended up doing. But this time we wanted to include the perspectives of, of those from the system and policy side of things as well, just to see if we could try and maybe intervene and bridge gaps in some way. So our purpose was threefold. So first it was to understand what um, OHT participants found challenging about the system and policy environment. Um, secondly, we wanted to look at um, how system level participants responded to these challenges. And um, lastly, we wanted to understand what the perspectives and concerns of system level participants themselves were as it related to um, OHT implementation. So we collected data from November 2022 to February 2023, and the data are probably important because things have significantly changed since then and on the policy end of things. And this involved interviewing 18 participants from both the system and OHTs. Um, the 10 system participants included people from the ministry and from um, OH, which is the crown agency responsible for the administration of Ontario's healthcare system. Um, the cross-boundary stakeholders were people who didn't identify with either category or perhaps cross both in some way. So the questions we asked were guided by things that we had learned during the development um, developmental evaluation, as well as a symposium and a webinar that was held soon after. So interviews were transcribed, thematically coded, and then analyzed. So OHCs felt that there was a lack of direction which affected their ability to confidently move ahead. This affected everything from governance, digital initiatives, coordination with home and community care to performance me uh, measurement. Now, system stakeholders were a little bit calmer. It was evident that they had a much deeper understanding of end state vision. Uh, they knew about plans to streamline, streamline communication, to track funding envelopes, things like that. They knew exactly how the various provincial committees and the working groups related to each other and so on. System stakeholders were also concerned that OHTs did not really have a good understanding of the learning and capacity building that was needed to develop as an OHT. And they weren't sure if OHTs truly understood um, things like the range of things that home and community care um, services does, support services does, how to make primary care cornerstone of, of the OHT model without necessarily letting it drive everything, um, how to use population level data packages to harness the performance measurement expertise that was already available to these teams. And even, you know, for in some cases, how to actually successfully interpret and respond to a funding call. And so system stakeholders thought it was more important for, for OHTs to figure certain things out um, 
you know, rather than waiting for an instruction sheet to be given to them from above. Um, uh, now, having said that, system stakeholders were also very concerned that they were unable to tell OHTs how to get to the end state, but they felt that this was, this was somehow be beyond their control. There was a bit of a tendency to, to see themselves as bureaucrats with little power to truly change things. It was up to the government and political will to enact change, or so they thought. So there was a sudden deferral of authority. So here you have some quotes. Um, so first from the OHT perspective and then from the system and policy perspective. So here's someone from an OHT saying, they, the ministry, were every OHT, you decide on your own governance model. And you know what? It's a mess. They now think they've landed on a solution, which is incorporation. It's like saying, yes, you need a house. Great. How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? How many flows? How big? How small? What's in it? What's not in it? It is a shell to which um, the system stakeholders respond. You're trying to nudge Jello along. Simply moving all of the levers to the OHTs is not going to do anything. And I know that people on the front line of planning and delivery are like, you just described a nightmare to me because you've given me no clarity. But there's no shortcut like, by saying, I'm giving you um, this and, and that will make everything else happen. And someone else says, we haven't committed all of the steps of the maturity vision, and that is what keeps me up at night. And our inability to be very transparent about that is to be expected, because if you set out every step of the way out of the very mature vision, there are some very hard uh, policy decisions to be made, very big things to move. And I don't think that there's yet comfort in taking those steps. So now, um, when guidance was provided, provided, of course, it wasn't universally welcome. The standardized provincial expectations could not account for local specificities, perhaps particularly so for indigenous teams or um, teams in rural areas. There was also some pushback on secret measures, so these are the quality improvement measures, as well as guidance on governance. So essentially, OHTs wanted an approach to population health management that accounted for a difference. Now, system stakeholders, for their part, were keenly aware of the need to provide, provide guidance while somehow allowing for local flavor. They were also wondering how equity fit into this piece. So for instance, would treating certain OHCs and populations differently compromise equity? Would it enhance equity, right? So now system participants also had a very different understanding of um, the quality improvement indicators and what they represented. So they saw them as a way for the province to signal to OHCs what they saw as important, as well as perhaps for a way for OHTs to identify what they what needed to be changed, but certainly not as judgment, which is probably how the OHTs saw things. Um, so you see here an OHT participant saying, some of the secret measures we found were probably a lot hospital focused, so the ALC stuff, et cetera. I'm just surprised they didn't get more granular in terms of like, this is what's in your catchment area that you should be focusing on. Someone else says, we're very grounded in our seven grandfather teachings. We knew we wanted to be highly indigenous led in our leadership principles. So that's not going to come about by way of a um, provincial template. To which the system stakeholders holders respond, we do want OHTs to take a population health management approach, which means by default, there is a localness to it, a specificity to their own population. But at the same time, there will never not be provincial priorities for the health system. So I think that there is a tension that remains and we will have to find a way to manage that tension. Someone else says the indicators were a way to start signaling our expectations for OHTs. It wasn't that we would expect an OHT to be able to have all these levers to drive the changes, but the members need to look around and say, oh, this is a system priority. Am I pulling my weight here? So it's a really important signaling exercise. Okay, we need adequate sustained funding to make a difference. So this was, of course, before the announcement of multi-year funding was made, um, but it was at a time the OHTs had already been working with lots of um, annual funding that was buttressed by various smaller um, funding pockets. Now this seemed to affect staff retention, perhaps most of all. Um, so system participants, for their part, they wanted OHTs to focus on value-based care. So they thought that true sustainability came when funds were not externally provided, but rather generated from within through integration. The OHTs would likely say that in order to get there, they needed to have um, you know, close loop control over their funding, and this was yet to happen. 
Um, and they, they would say that they perhaps needed a, an injection of sustained funds to help them navigate the early admin work needed to, to allow for, um, you know, this to happen. Now, interestingly, the two participants who did not identify with either the OHTs or the system, they thought that funding should be taken out of the equation entirely. They thought the focus should be on integration itself and providing tailored guidance and resources to help OHTs address whatever it was that stood in the way of integration. Okay, so here's an OHT saying, I feel like these people that I've hired are like unicorns that wake up every single day and dedicate their whole life to progressing this model and working with our partners. And they've developed this trust and this relationship. And I'm terrified that because they don't know whether or not they have a job in August, that of course they would leave. Um, on the right, you hear someone from um, the system responding, the teams have to extract value back out of the system. We probably have to enable that to happen in certain ways. But I think that uh, there are a handful of teams that say, this is worth so much that even if the ministry stop funding us, we'll still find a way to continue this work. I like that attitude a lot. And someone in the middle, this is an alternative perspective, someone who doesn't believe, um, or rather belong in either of these boxes saying, take money off the table, focus on integration. The government thinks it's all about money. It should be about in integration and then investing where integration is not happening. Similarly, every single conversation with healthcare providers begins with two words, more funding, instead of what are the steps that are necessary to achieve integration and where can we invest in those steps to affect change? Is it you don't have equipment? Is it you don't have enough beds in your hospital and so on? So OHD participants were not clear about the roles of certain system participants and the relationships between the various system players. So for example, what was the role of OH regions versus OH corporate? Uh, what did relationship managers actually do? Why were there so many layers? Why did there, there seem to be so much overlap between what some system stakeholders were doing and what OHDs themselves were doing? The system participants were much more tolerant of this uncertainty because for them it didn't quite exist in the same way. They understood their roles, they understood how their roles related to each other, and they basically just wanted OHDs to have patience with the evolution on the way. Um, system participants also thought that the value of system partners is not fully recognized. Uh, so they felt that, in, that some in OHD world felt that they were perhaps even in competition with OH because they didn't fully understand everything that um, OH regions did or what certain roles potentially could offer. System stakeholders also knew that certain OHDs the ones chosen as pilot sites for various things, for instance, would have a closer relationship with um, system stakeholders than others. So this so, so basically knowledge what was not necessarily uniform across teams. Okay, so here's a, an OHT participant saying, I asked the OH clinical population specific lead to come to the OHT and present. And when they did, it was a kerfuffle, of course, because everyone's like, what? All this work is happening? What is our role? If that's your role to develop all the pathways and all these things, what the heck are we doing here? And someone else says, we got rid of the lens and now we've created OH. I don't understand the need for the layers. Give them the role of OHD executive lead and we'll go back to our desks. It just seems like we have positions that are funded by OH through our funding. And um, system participants respond, because this OH wasn't a pilot site or a leading project site for either of the two pathways that have already rolled out, they just hear it differently. They're not aware that, oh, okay, this is already happening. Someone else says, in an ideal state, they see their OH regional counterparts as sources of regional expertise, as allies in their entry way to OH, and as a really positive source of information and brokering across OHDs. OHTs have maybe an unrealistic expectation of the level of admin and control they could have at the scale that they currently exist. So here's um, some of the things that we um, glean from all of this. So OHT participants seem to be prioritizing local concerns over those of the health system. They tended to see themselves as separate from or in competition with the system. And sometimes they lacked an understanding of the limits of their own capacity and knowledge. As for system and policy participants, they were familiar actually with OHD concerns, but they were unable to, res to respond freely and share their own concerns. And this could lead to OHD participants feeling like um, their system counterparts were 
divorced from on the ground concerns. He also seemed um, somewhat unaware that the motive behind um, chosen performance measures uh, had been actually misunderstood by many, and that it was not enough for system level stakeholders alone to know about future state. Um, they also expected OHCs to understand the importance of identifying and uh, filling knowledge gaps and generating value from within without reiterating this need, without guiding the work required to get there. And they also lacked an understanding of the need to demonstrate the value of system structures and roles to OHTs. So these are some recommendations for OHTs. Um, some, it'll be followed in the next slide by um, recommendations for system stakeholders. Perhaps they could, you know, OHTs could develop an understanding of system level priorities and pilot initiatives, the rationale for why these priorities are actually prioritized. Um, perhaps you could develop a, an understanding of system level structures and roles. So, you know, the um, responsibilities and role scope of OH corporates versus OH regions. Um, what are some available supports, system level planning tables? What are um, central, um, the central um, program of supports that's available? Uh, what are communities of practice that they, that they can perhaps take advantage of? Secondly, um, they might want to reconceptualize the relationship with the system from one of competition to cooperation. Uh, and one way to do this might be to invite OH representatives to OHT tables where possible. And they could develop a reflexive understanding of the limits of their own knowledge and capacity and develop a plan to address these gaps, possibly by tapping into already available supports where possible. So recommendations for system stakeholders. Okay, so start perhaps with building trust through communication and transparency with OHTs. To so share plans where possible to mitigate OHT anxieties and as a re reminder of in-state vision. Share information on how existing planning tables may inform OHD level work. Build even relationships with OHD so that those that are not pilot sites don't feel left behind. And set clear expectations for what the system expects of OHDs and what OHDs can, can expect of the system. So reiterate expectations of value generation, clarify the purpose and the planned evolution of um, quality improvement indicators. Thirdly, demonstrate the value of system level structures, supports and roles to mitigate confusion about responsibilities. And again, encourage the meaningful embedding of OH at OHT tables. Um, both work with OHTs to identify and address gaps in knowledge and capacity. Um, monitor the needs of OH OHTs with contextual factors that affect capacity building, things like, you know, um, being an indigenous or rural OHTs, and this can be part of an equity-driven approach. Uh, and finally, establish or endorse common supports that OHTs can systematically draw upon with confidence that they do in fact have system approval and cross OHT applicability, so they won't be expected to change the way they're doing things, you know, for, for five months down the line. Thank you.